From years of anxiety to warrior and mentor, Bradley Robinson created the Anxiety Project to help you end your anxiety naturally. Let's mold the new you and let's end anxiety together. Hello and welcome everybody in the recovery community to another episode of the Anxiety Project podcast. I am Brad Robinson. Today is a very enriching episode about trauma. I took so much of what I've learned over the years reading books on trauma and going through these trauma release exercises with myself and and my clients. I've noticed many things revolving around what trauma really is and how we can separate ourselves and release our ties with the past and move forward and enjoy the present moment because trauma can really impede on us enjoying the present day to day. And if we don't integrate the dark parts of our personality, they come out in unconscious, destructive ways. They are projected onto the people that we care about. They are projected onto our coworkers and We even see this projection in the mirror. When we look into the mirror, we see this distorted figure. And and that impedes our self-confidence. We hold on to the grief. We hold on to the shame and the guilt. So how can we move past all of this that is hindering our growth and in the quality of our life? So I took some passages from some of my favorite books on trauma, Uh, Letting Go by David R. Hawkins. I'll read you a passage from that. And I'll read you a passage from a great book that you you have to read. The Body Keeps the Score. I'm sure you've heard of this before by Bessel van der Kolk. Super popular. But I have some great stuff in there that will help you understand what is going on internally and how you can resolve the internal conflict. So... To start off this episode, the body will do what it can to get you to notice that there are unresolved past negative, painful experiences that need to be resolved and let go of. The body will let you know. In some ways, it does this. You might know this one when you're on the subway, when you're driving, when you're sitting in the doctor's office, the mind goes to a certain past particular experience and you get sucked into the trance-like state of it and you sort of relive the emotion and you catch yourself and it's like, oh my God, as soon as you, as soon as you get to the height of the trauma, you come back into the present moment. It's like you're, you want to block it and you push it away and then you distract yourself with something else, with your phone, with whatever it is. And we... I get, I got this all the time. And so what, what that is, is that your body is holding on to this experience and it's letting you know that, Hey, pay attention to me. You haven't fully understood what happened back here. You have to understand what happened back here so that you don't walk into the same painful experience again in the future. It's looking out for us in some sense. And you might go, well, that's why would it do that? It's like, yeah, I mean, it's strange, right? But you might not see it that way, but it's certainly, it's certainly there. It's, it's, it's certainly a message that you have to pay attention to and the body will do what it can. Other ways that your body will let you know that you have trauma is the stories that play out in your mind. And so some stories will be something like, oh, I'll never change because um, I have something wrong with my brain. And that's why I'm anxious. And how can I change that? It's like, okay, wh- where does the story stem from? And can you reframe this story and look at it from a different perspective and tell yourself a new story so that this is not limiting you from reaching your higher self, right? And so that's another thing to, to note is that these stories are very damaging and, and traumatic in some sense because they are causing a lot of negative emotion. And where are they stemming from? Well, 
man, that's an onion that you have to peel back. And then another way trauma can manifest itself from the, in the body and, and be a message and a signal to you is through illness, body aches, body pains, and you could end up with um, some autoimmune problem. And so let's look at this autoimmune problem first and, and add some more context around why the body is is producing an illness. Well, the first thing is, if your body is in threat detection mode continuously, your body is burning up a lot of resources. And because it's burning up resources, your immune system becomes compromised and you know the rest. It, you're more susceptible for illnesses and um, sickness. Your body can't, it's not wise to be in that threat detection mode for a long period of time. It's not wise. Your body will break down. There's almost there's only so much fuel in the tank. And if a car is running on no oil for a long period of time, then the, the engine's going to just break down. And so to elaborate more on this illness bit, if your body holds on to a very high emotional memory that revolves around a painful experience. The body obsesses over it like the chimpanzee obsessing over the snake and spending hours and days in the tree staring at the snake. And they do this. And I find this so interesting because it reminds me it reminds me of me and human beings in general. What happens when anomaly comes in? We're transfixed over it. Same with me when I was suffering from health anxiety. I was transfixed over the anomaly that was my sensations because anxiety produced so many strange body aches and pains and dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, indigestion, uh, uh, the fainting feelings, the list goes on so many and just feeling out of control was an anomaly, right? Because when your anxiety system is on, you feel out of control. It's like something else took over and you're trying desperately to regain control. It's like you're obsessing over your internal world. Like what is going on? What is the snake inside of me? And you're just transfixed over this thing. You're trying to make sense of it mainly to learn how to not get yourself into the situation again in the future. But like myself and many of us here in the Western world, I live in Canada, we're not taught how to properly confront and let go of these traumas so that we can move forward. A piece of us is still stuck in the past until we change the meaning behind the past we change the meaning, we change the emotion. So when you catch yourself in that trance-like state and the emotion is negative, cause you some pain, guilt, shame, embarrassment, that's a signal that the emotion needs to be resolved and let go of. Now, I am certified in NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. I'll break that down for you guys in a bit because it is a mouthful. I know. I, I Trust me, for a lo the longest time, I didn't know what the heck that meant. But I learned the only way to heal from the past is to confront it. This is universally true, not just in NLP, but in all psychotherapy. In order to move past your past, you have to confront it first. You have to go into the places that you do not want to go. <laughs> that We see this in movies too. We see this in like, uh, what's that movie with tr uh, training, uh, train spotting? He goes through the toilet into the underworld. In Harry Potter, you see the same thing. He goes through the 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 bathroom, the, the, the pipes in the bathroom to get into the underworld, right? The only way to defeat the snake is to go through the, the muck and the, the grudge and, 
you know, it's like the the place you won't expect the snake to be is in the the bathroom pipes, is in the the underworld, which is the entrance is in the bathroom. It's so fascinating to me. I, I, I've we, and we see that in uh, the Knights of the Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, right? To find the Holy Grail, each knight has to enter the forest that is most darkest to them. So what you need the most is found in the place you least want to look. Now, I want to read you a passage from David R. Hawkins, his book, uh, Letting Go. This is one of my favorite books. I couldn't recommend this book enough. So, Healing from the Past. When we look at our lives, we will see the residual of past life crises, which are still unresolved. Thoughts and feelings about the events tend to occur and color our perception. And we will note that they have disabled us in certain areas of life. At that point, it is wise to ask ourselves if it is worth paying the continuing cost. Now that we have some mechanisms by which to handle these residuals, they can be uncovered. The residual feelings can be investigated and let go of so that a healing can take place. This brings us to another emotional healing technique that becomes powerful once the major event has passed. That is to place the event in a different context, to see it from a different perspective, and to hold it in a different paradigm with a different significance and meaning. It is said that most people spend their lives regretting the past and fearing the future. Therefore, they are unable to experience joy in the present. Many of us have assumed that this is our human fate, our lot, and the best that we can do is grin and bear it. One of the most effective tools for handling the past is the creation of a different context. What this means is that we give it a different meaning we take on a different attitude about the past difficulty or trauma and we acknowledge the hidden gift in it. The value of this technique was first recognized in psychiatry by Viktor Frankl. He explained the approach, which he called logotherapy, in his famous book, Man's Search for Meaning. His clinical and personal experience demonstrated that emotional events and Traumatic occurrences will change considerably and be healed if a new meaning is placed around them. Frankel told of his own experience in the Nazi concentration camps, wherein he came to see his physical and psych psychic suffering as an opportunity to achieve inner triumph. Everything can be taken from a man, but one thing the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Frankel, 1959. Amazing. In NLP, the NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. Neuro, the circuits in the brain, Linguistic, the language that we use and the programming. Now, changing the language, changing the context, change the internal and external programming. Now, what does NLP, what, what is its function? Well, to guide you through a set of strategies that will help you re-encounter the trauma, but reframe it through a script-like structure. And I have a meditation, I'll leave a link below, that you can do today that'll help you reframe uh, a traumatic experience. And I recommend that you do this on a memory that is more than a year old. Because sometimes we, if it's a really traumatic moment within the past year, it can re-traumatize you. But don't worry, because I've done this um, before, and I've done this with my clients, and when you approach it voluntarily and, and you are aware that this is something that's going to be difficult for you, 
you activate exploratory circuits rather than fear circuits. So just keep that in mind. To properly integrate all the parts of your psyche, you need to look towards the dark parts of yourself because it's those dark parts of yourself, like I stated at the beginning of this podcast, if they're not properly integrated, they will come out in unconscious, destructive ways. Now, I heard Russell Brand talk about having the thought of throwing the baby. And because you're aware of throwing the baby means that you're not going to throw the baby. That the thought is there because the mind likes to explore the unknown. And in the unknown, the possibility of throwing the baby, well, that's real, right? Because you're so self-conscious of existence and the capacity of individuals doing extreme harm to each other. And I feel like because you have that thought, you're not going to throw the baby. Recognizing this thought is recognizing this fear that this is possible, that, well, the baby could be harmed in some way and you could be the one to do it. People who actually throw the baby do it unconsciously, impulsively. They don't even have the thought. It's like a reflex. They just, it's out of anger because anger, there's no consciousness when it comes to anger, right? Like it's like this deity within you that takes over and it's like you are no longer rational. You are no longer in the present moment. So when you're holding the baby and you have that thought, it's like throwing the baby, it's startling, but because you have it means that you're not going to do it. Because if you really ask yourself, is this how I feel? Like if you have a negative thought about someone you care about, ask yourself, well, is that really true? You know, really ask yourself that. And underneath the surface, what would come up for me is, no, of course not. Then then I would go, okay, well, why did I have that thought? Well, challenge it. And I would challenge it. It's like, I would kind of laugh it off. I would even switch the voice into like a Homer Simpson cartoony voice. Like it's some eight year old child voice inside of me. And it's like, I don't, because I have the thought doesn't mean I have to entertain the thought. Right. And so I find that really interesting, but to go back to this notion of what you need to find is where you least want to look. You have to and you must subject the sword to the fire. You must subject it to the intensity of the heat and then it becomes malleable and then you hammer the sword into place and you repeatedly do this until it becomes a high quality weapon. And the same goes to your mind. If you're not willing to go into the fire, then how do you expect things to change. A lot of people I see going through recovery, they fall back into their old ways. And when they when they fall back there, they then project outwards that this is not working. I'm suffering too much. Uh, make this stop. Things are never going to change. And then I go, well, you just fell back into your old ways and you're not sticking to the disciplines just because they didn't work for you in one week doesn't mean that you should throw in the bath, you know, the, the, the towel. So keep pushing yourself, keep going into the fire because think of it like this. What, what were you doing before? Maybe you should do the opposite. Well, that was my attitude going through anxiety recovery. Maybe, you know, the, did the old Brad sit in the library and read for a couple hours? No. Okay. I'm going to do that. Did the old Brad meditate? No, I'm going to do that. Uh, did the old Brad get exercise and go for walks and spend a lot of time in nature? A bit, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to do it more now. So, you know, I was I was constantly re- reaching outside of what was comfortable for me and, and a lot of the answers, all the answers I needed were in those areas, that I, in the darkness. And so we see in our current current climate today people are using medications alcohol drugs excess phone use excess video games pornography um, to numb soothe and distract from these emotions that are just too difficult to contend with well they're seemingly difficult to contend with and then it gets to the point where 
you go to sleep and then what happens when you're in your bed with no distractions whatsoever the alcohol is wearing off the the weed is wearing off the the medications are wearing off whatever it is and then it's just you in your own mind what happens the monsters come out the unconscious is 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 it's like the doors to the unconscious open and all the monsters, whatever you haven't contended with, are coming up to the surface and it overwhelms a lot of people. That's why a lot of people suffer from insomnia or they stay up late at night and they watch TV and they, you know, they're distracting themselves and they drink too much. And it's because, you know, when you start to fall and the brain waves start to slow down, the unconscious starts to open up and then all of that baggage rises up bubbles up to the surface now carl Jung says this also those parts of you those monsters they need to be integrated otherwise they will come out unconsciously and destructively like i also said so let us revisit the chimpanzee example because you know a lot of us we tend to obsess over the unmastered because what is out in the unknown that could do us in right so to explore this voluntarily this activates the exploratory brain circuits rather than those fear circuits and so to reframe the past you must revisit the height of the trauma you must associate yourself with the image and movie of the trauma in your mind and change the submodalities. So what this means is I'll get someone to, during my coaching, I'll get the client to relax and breathe in and to, you know, get in touch with their body. They're so detached from their body. They, they, they must activate these the parasympathetic nervous system so that they can access more of the imagery and emotions of the trauma. And so they, they bring up the image of the trauma and they connect with it, right? Like, is it a movie? Is it a still? Is it close to you? Is it far away? Is it in black and white? Is it in color? Is it a heavy feeling? Is it a light feeling? What's the color associated to it? Is it a cold feeling? Is it a hot feeling? Whereabouts in your body do you feel the heaviness? And um, they'll point to a certain body part of their body, neck, neck, he uh, neck head, um, chest, whatever it is. And they'll, they'll get in touch and then I'll get them to go to the height of the trauma. And then I will walk them through a reframing process where they can look at this trauma from a different perspective and attach meaning around the trauma so that it no longer is associated with fear and dread rather than like you, like you heard in, in the passage from Letting Go, you're changing the context. You're changing the context. And then you are no longer associating so much anxiety and stress towards the certain memory. Perhaps it was a good thing that this event happened to you because it made you stronger, possibly in some way. That's another thing to examine. But then you can also say, well, but Brad, what if I begin to do this exercise and I can't get through it? Like the trauma is too much. Well, try writing it down on, in detail on a piece of paper. Talk about this experience in detail with somebody you trust, like a coach or a therapist. But more often than not, you'll be surprised that you are able to do this. And I suggest, like I also mentioned before, that you... Begin with memories more than one year old. Now, I would push my clients to visit the trauma because sometimes their brains, and I know where they're coming from, will convince them that this doesn't need to be resolved. So, for example, a common trauma around a health anxiety sufferer would be checking on their symptoms in a part of their body. Now, I would ask them, well, what is the first body part you began to obsess over? And then they'll go, okay, well, it was, um, I would say, usually it's privates. 
that's a very, very, very common one. For me, it was, it was privates. And then I would say, okay, well, when did it start? It started at this age, at this time. Well, what happened? And then they'll tell me what happened exactly. And do you feel like this is a traumatizing moment in your life? And sometimes I'll go, oh, no, no, I don't need to. I feel pretty good about it. But then I'll be like, okay, well, like, I'll get you to relax. I'll, you know, I'll get you to close your eyes, get in touch with your body, get in touch with your parasympathetic nervous system, you know, you get into a relaxed state so the unconscious can do its thing. And then I say, okay, well, bring up the the image or the movie of the experience, of the memory. And how do you feel? Like, is it a strong feeling? How intense is it? And then in more, most cases, the client would go, well, it's really intense. And I'll actually see them getting emotional. Is it heavy? And then they go, yeah, it's heavy. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, they, they said it didn't need to be reframed. But when I got them into that relaxed state and I got them in touch with their unconscious, the emotion is blatantly obvious. It hasn't been let go of. That's still heavy. It's still weighing on them. And so it's time to reframe at this point. The mind can convince you that there is no trauma because you've practiced not confronting it and it wants to avoid pain, right? It's a paradox. It wants to avoid pain, but it needs to confront pain in order to release it. And now to conclude the podcast, I want to read you a passage from Bessel van der Kolk's uh, The Body Keeps the Score. In order to regain control over yourself, you need to revisit the trauma. Sooner or later, you need to confront what has happened to you, but only after you feel safe and will not be re-traumatized by it. The first order of business is to find ways to cope with feeling overwhelmed by the sensations and emotions associated with the past. The fundamental issue in resolving traumatic stress is to restore the proper balance between the rational and emotional brains so that you can feel in charge of how you respond and how you conduct your life. When we're triggered into states of hyper or hyper arousal, we are pushed outside our window of tolerance, the range of optimal functioning. We become reactive and disorganized. Our filters stop working. Sounds and lights bother us. Unwanted images from the past intrude our minds and we panic or fly into rages. If we're shut down, we feel numb in body and mind. Our thinking becomes sluggish and we have trouble getting out of our chairs. If we want to change post-traumatic reactions, we have to access the emotional brain and do limbic system therapy, repairing faulty alarm systems and restoring the emotional brain to its ordinary job of being a quiet background presence that takes care of the housekeeping of the body, ensuring that you eat, sleep, connect with intimate partners, protect your children, and defend against danger. The neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux and his colleagues have shown that the only way we can consciously access the emotional brain is through self-awareness, i.e. by activating the medial prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that notices what is going on inside us and thus allows us to feel what we're feeling. Most of our conscious brain is dedicated to focusing on the outside world, getting along with others and making plans for the future. However, that does not help us manage ourselves. Neuroscience research shows that the only way we can change the way we feel is by becoming aware of our inner experience and learning to befriend what is going on inside ourselves. I see... That's the end of the the passage. I see through my mentors, like Wim Hof, the breathing, that we can tap into these deeper systems. When you breathe deeply 
and you do this for a lengthy period of time, you start to activate these rest systems that regulate our day-to-day properly. But also what's so interesting is that when you go into, when you do these breathing exercises, you fall into, I don't want to say an unconsciousness, but you, you're, you're, you're more relaxed and able to confront emotions when you engage in breathing. And it's same with running too, like David Goggins, how he healed himself from all of his uh, past through vigorous exercise, running for lengthy periods of times. When he gets to that point where, you know, on his fifth mile or 10th mile or 50th mile, whatever it is, the, the, because he's with himself, because he's in this state, I, I, I want to say he's in this um, more susceptible state to confronting these past emotions. Because when you are in a deep state of relaxation, you're more open to the emotions and they tend to come up. And the breathing and the exercise are great tools to allow for this to happen. It's almost like because you are able to confront the pain of the deep breathing or the fifth or tenth mile and move past it, get over that hump mentally, your unconscious brings up painful past emotions, memories, more willingly knowing that you have, well, you're more open and stable mentally to confront and release them. That's something to think about. And that's where I'm going to leave you on today's podcast episode. If you haven't already, I'd greatly appreciate it if you rate this podcast on Spotify. It'll help get the message out to more people. If you find this podcast useful, please share it with somebody you know. And I want to... I want to hear what you have to say about it. If you're following on YouTube, which I hope you are, please leave your comments below the video version of the podcast. Let me know what you think. And also, if you have any suggestions on what I should tackle next, let me know as well. Rise above anxiety. I will see you on the next podcast episode. Bye for now. Brad's Powerful Anxiety Recovery Program is now available at unpluganxiety.com. The Anxiety Project Program is downloadable and puts the power of anxiety recovery in your own hands. Visit unpluganxiety.com for more details. Recovery starts now.